What's up, guys? How you guys doing? You good? That was pathetic. Let's try that again. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. Man, um, we, me and AJ decided to tag team this because um, I'll just rip the Band-Aid off. We thought we were going to have a few more months with you guys, but um, this, is pretty, this is pretty much our announcement that uh, we are wrapping up here at Riverwood. So both AJ and I will do one more message, and then it's a wrap for us here. Um, and so we decided we wanted to do this thing uh, together, and instead of doing your typical sermon message style, we wanted to just be able to have a conversation in front of you guys, about you guys, and just in faith in general. You guys have made such a tremendous impact on us. It's, um, I don't know, I, I would say I, uh, I don't look very positively at the American church often, I'll put it that way, and this, this church makes me feel like there is hope. Um, you, you guys fight a good fight. Um, we, we come from a culture where if you, if you go anywhere else in the world where Christianity is not okay and you see how life and death faith is, and then you come here and you realize one bad message will make someone leave a church. If you remove an instrument, it'll make someone leave the church. If they have a conflict with someone in this church or in, in some church to leave the church, it really doesn't take much for someone to give up in America. Do you know what I'm saying? And you go anywhere else in the world, and it is a life and death fight every day, and they wake up with willingness to die for their faith like our forefathers did. You look at any one of the disciples of Jesus Research this. Don't even let me tell you about it. Figure out how they died. Did they, did they die perpetuating a faith that was a lie because they got rich? Because none of them got rich. Did they get fame and influence? They got influence, but it wasn't good. Peter was crucified upside down. John, was it John? He was boiled. They boiled. But he, they boiled him in oil? Yeah. Steve, what happened to him? He was stoned, stoned to death. You know, and you could keep kind of going through this process, but most of the disciples of Jesus didn't have a happy ending in their lives. It was a life and death thing, and they were willing to die for it. And as a matter of fact, almost all of them except for John, which I would have preferred to die, not survive boiling oil. Um, but it was a life and death thing, and they chose death half the time. And I'm saying, and I promise you guys, you got th th this is America. You have no death to work towards other than, like, what we eat. But the church isn't going to kill you. Your faith isn't going to kill you. Being a Christian isn't going to kill you. But it is so easy for people to just give up because something didn't go right. And I share all that to say this is one of the first churches I have seen that fights a really good fight. And you guys understand what it means to be the church. Whoever's standing on stage talking does not make the church. The worship doesn't make the church. It's the people who are in, the, in this building who are sitting in these seats that make this church. Amen. Every day you guys have showed up. And I just think you guys have so much coming to you because you're willing to fight such a good fight. You guys do not give up. And there is no surrender in you. And I can promise you, whoever is on this stage speaking has very little to do with how much this church accomplishes and has everything to do with the people in this room who are willing to fight the good fight. And you guys have fought hard and haven't given up. So just keep fighting, and I promise, I promise you guys will see churchwide miracles. All right, so that's my announcement. Now we're going to get into a conversation. Is that cool? All right, let me pray first so I uh, hopefully don't crack. But Jesus, we just come before you. We just pray, God, that um, this time that we have together is uh, God-breathed. I pray, God, that you are breathing on this moment. I pray that you armor us, that you put your spirit in us, speak through us, and God, help us to have a moment that draws us closer to you and blesses this church. So we surrender to you, God, and we just pray that your will is done and not ours. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to have some of our... 
not that we have a lot, so don't. None of this is scripted, okay? Uh, w there's just something about. He planned to say that. Totally. Which is yeah, it was a script. <laughs> uh, there, there, there's a level of authenticity that comes from a conversation that you can't get from writing a sermon because everything is scripted, do you know? Like, and the more insecure you are, like I am, the moments I smile are probably scripted. You know, like that's how scripted messages get. So I just wanted to do something that was more conversational and just give you guys as much of an authentic um, experience as we can give you. So we'll just start off with a question. I'm going to start off with asking AJ a question. Again, I have no idea what he's going to say. So if he says something inappropriate, it's not my fault. Um, but kind of. Cause kind you invited, invited you. Yeah. Thanks, AJ. All right. So um, first question is, you're like me, you're an entrepreneur, you get into business world, you're surrounded by some big wigs, we'll just say. Um, so what made you want to come here and even do this thing with me? Um, the, the journey to get me to the platform here, um, there was a day that I thought I wanted to be a pastor because when I was young, a lot of people told me I should be a pastor or that that's what it meant to follow God. If you're going to do what God wants you to do, then you need to be a pastor. And that's what, that's what Christians do, right? Um, so there's a lot of different reasons in my 44 years of living that I would have ended up on a platform like this. But to be where I'm at today and to be on a platform like this, um, a couple months ago, the first, time I, the first time I spoke here was, I think it was in May, maybe the first week of June, and I shared the teaching with a friend of mine, and he and his wife watched it, and his wife said, wait a minute, I don't understand. I thought AJ like, was a writer, and he did this stuff with a, this business, and he did this, and this, why is he preaching? And this buddy of mine said what I believe to be like the greatest honor of a job description that I could ever receive, and it was, he said, I think AJ does whatever Jesus puts in his path. There is, a, there is a profound peace to be found in the presence of God. And when you've interacted with someone who's been in the presence of God, it drips on you. Much like when, when uh, Jesus' uh, feet were washed with the expensive perfume. Um, who was it that was that Mary that did that? And, it, and when, when it was over, he smelled like her and she smelled like him. It's like to be in his presence and it just drips on you and you smell like him. <laughs> and I've had moments where I've just smelled like him. And, and there's nothing like it. And so I want to live my life in his presence doing that. So to me, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a job title or a job description. I want to live my life um, doing whatever Jesus puts in my path. And the way this came in was through a dear friend um, who said, let's partner in, in, in doing this together. And so it's just, what, what is Jesus going to put in my path? And I get to talk about the word of God, and I get to talk about the presence of God. Are you kidding me? I get to do that? Someone's going to trust me with a microphone and let me talk about Jesus. There was just nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Um, and that was my... That's my reason. It's not about being an entrepreneur or a business leader or who I talk to or who I meet. It's just about getting to smell like him and him like me when we're that close to each other. And then to just feel his good pleasure when we talk about him. I could have, truthfully, I would have, I would have been just fine if we wouldn't have talked at all. And we just sang the words over and over, how great is our God. How great is our God. He has overcome the world. How great is our God. I could have done that. All day long. <laughs> and that's why. Amen. So, follow that one. <laughs> no, why you, man? Like, honestly, uh, like, I can honestly say, like, I see this dude live a life. I, I talked about a little bit a couple weeks ago. Like, he's full throttle all the time. You guys see it. Like, what you because see. Because I'm not good at anything what, I do. If you guys forgot what he said. I, I, no, I said that's why it takes you so, why you're so busy, because it takes you longer oh, to do the thing. okay, okay. No, honestly, like, this guy, the, the, the guy that you see up here in Milwaukee is, is the guy that I have lunch with, the guy that we talk about God, we talk about work, we talk about ideas. 
that's the same guy. Full throttle, pedal to the metal all the time. Um, to the point that even in his own talk, he talks about how it's a weakness too, where you just don't rest or whatever. But what makes a guy like that do something like this? Yeah, ironically, this is going to feel cheap, but I, I told you guys I've had many, many interim opportunities, 27 in total, and I've said yes to one of them. And it was this church. Um, I, don't, I don't know why, I just know God was in it. It wasn't it wasn't just a good recruiter trying to bring me in for my town, except Kevin, where's Kevin? You're a good recruiter. I don't care how you try to hide behind that. You did well. Um, but it wasn't about good recruiting. It was just like, I, I don't know how to explain it other than you, you just kind of sense God in it. And it's not, I don't feel like I'm walking away from an opportunity or something like that because I'm really good at saying no to a lot of things. Well, now I used to be terrible at it. Um, but this one, it was just like in my face. And I, everywhere I went, there was just Riverwood. All I'm thinking about is Riverwood. I had dreams about Riverwood, you know? And I was just like, ah, this is annoying. I would literally put up barriers being like, These, there's no way this church will scale this barrier, this barrier, and this barrier for me to commit to it. And even if they are, it's going to take them months of deliberation and talking and consensus and blah, 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 blah before they get there. By that time, it'll be too late anyway. It was like next day. And I was like, oh, man, I might actually have to do this. I might actually have to do this. And I, and I would say it in those actual words to my wife. I'd be like, babe, I think I actually might have to do this. She goes, shut up. You're not going to do it. Like, I, uh, I might. And anyways, like the whole purpose of me being here is just like I, I honest to God, just it was just God. I don't I don't know why, but I I do know this when I sense the presence of God somewhere and I um, see how hard he's pushing and what he's willing to do and what he's willing to bring in. It's one of those types of situations where it's hard for me to look at this church and not want to just stay around for a while to see what that miracle is. You know, I, I kind of want to witness what that crazy breakthrough is. I want to celebrate it with you guys because there's very few churches I would say this about, but you guys freaking earned it. You guys deserve it. And whatever God has for you is going to blow your minds. And I, I just want to be here to see it when that day comes. And I would say the only reason, my personal reason for being here is just I... Yeah, God, there's something here for you guys. God has something for you guys. There's something that's going to pop off, and pop off is a very ghetto terminology. Um, that means something is going to break loose um, in this church at some point, and I just don't know what it is, but like I said, I'm really eager to figure out what you guys have here. So let me ask you this, um, at AJ. As we go into um, all the topics that we've covered here in terms of the sermons that we've covered and the topics that we've talked about, which has been a lot. What are some of your highlights that you would say you hope this congregation walks away with? It's like the things that you don't want them to forget about. I remember years ago, I was at a church where they were inviting children to come on the stage and co-lead worship with the the, the grown-ups, the ones who do it right. You know, we're going to teach you how to worship, young man, you know, whatever. And, and these kids were up there, and the kids were um, doing what they saw their moms and dads and the other leaders do. So you, it was a relatively charismatic church, and so you would see, I mean, you're, something funny. You know, you see this 8-year-old who's just like, he's doing this. And, you're, and this part of me became skeptical. There's no way an eight-year-old is doing that or whatever. It felt, I, I got skeptical. And then I realized, well, I sit, I grew up sitting like this because it's exactly what I saw. Why am I not skeptical of that? Because all I'm doing is emulating what I'm watching. And I think... To think of all the, the topics we've covered, the, the sermons, the, the series of religiously trained, I mean, there's a lot out there that we could talk about. For me, one of the, the biggest revelations that I 
that I continually need to come to and that I hope plants a seed in, in your heart is simply that a walk of faith, a decision to follow Jesus is not a hoop you jump through. It's a river you jump into. It doesn't come down to a decision about whether or not you're going here or here when you die. Those are byproducts to a river that you jump in. And, 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 so, I, and I, so I think back to the last time I talked and that story from my friend Steve about the, the splashing around in the water. And if I'm trying to get you in the water and all I do is just splash you with my religion, it's like, okay, now I'm cold, I'm frustrated, and I'm not inviting, invited. I'm not going to be attending this swimming party because I'm, you're frustrating me. But if I sit there and I watch people swim and I'm like, man, they're having fun. So for faith to move out of something, a decision we made or a hoop we jumped through and for it to be something we live so that when our kids emulate us, they're not emulating something anything or they're not emulating anything other than watching us swim i want in that's where the fun is it's that point god doesn't take normal people and turn them into freaks he takes freaks and turns them into normal people the man that you were before christ was not you didn't find jesus and then turn into a freak you found jesus and he's like now i get to build the army that i had in mind all along that is an adventure that's a river that we get in yeah. and that's not a hoop we jump through that's the oh man if we could do that it's just just living daily with jesus you haven't pointed at me this whole time until you started talking about freaks i just want to point that out <laughs> people get defensive about things that are true so the honest to God truth is the reason I can't preach here anymore is he has hurt my feelings too much. <laughs> and these boo-boos are going to take a long time to heal, so I just can't do it anymore because of AJ. Um, one, of, one of the things I, 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 I was just thinking about when you're sharing that is, this is completely random, but I had my daughter on my shoulders, Avi, the five-year-old, well, she's six now. I had her on my shoulders, and when we're in a worship night, um, She's used to seeing my arms go up. And I remember uh, she was worshiping while sitting on my shoulders. And so I, I, you know, I'm paranoid, criminal type guy. I hear like this hard step fast coming behind me. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't like the sound of that. So uh, we're sitting here worshiping and I just kind of turn around with my daughter and the guy looks at me like, like that underneath, like behind me. Uh, I was like, do you want a hug? You're like, I don't know what's going on. He's like, no, your, your daughter, her hands went back like this, and I thought she was just going <laughs> to throw herself back, and I was trying to catch her. I was like, oh, thank you. I was like, no, that's just what she does when we worship. And she goes, and he's like, he, she throws her hands and head back. He's like, yeah, it's, it's a long story. I'm kind of a dramatic worshiper, and uh, she kind of picked up on that. But it, it, it's this weird thing where my daughter would never do that standing on the ground. But when she's standing on my, sitting on my shoulders, sitting on the shoulders of her father, she, for whatever reason, even though that's almost six feet off the ground, that's her safe place to do it, is sitting on her dad's shoulders. That's the safest place for her to worship, is sitting on her dad's shoulders. And I don't, I don't even know why I'm getting on this tangent um, but maybe it's because I, I feel like God's dropped this thing in my heart where I just want you guys to know that you guys are standing on God's shoulders. You guys are sitting on God's shoulders. It's okay to worship the season you're in. The season you're in is not a bad season. Sometimes we get so convinced that the wilderness season or the desert season is like the bad season because it's, it's quiet and, and there's, it just feels desolate and we don't know what's going on. But here's the thing. If you even look at it from a biblical perspective... Some of the greatest miracles, some of the greatest movements of God that have ever taken place have taken place in the desert. Think about that. Where was Moses? Where was Elijah? Where did Jesus do his fast? 
Do you know, like, you can go down the list, but we have come, because we live in a culture that is very comfort and convenience based, very, you know, we, we start to look at these desolate desert wilderness type seasons as these bad seasons, but sometimes, sometimes the only way for us to hear the quiet, gentle whisper of God is you, God takes you to a place. He doesn't put you there. He doesn't kick you there. He doesn't shove you there. It's not like a forceful punishment, but he lets you get into these seasons that are more often than not man-made, and they become your wilderness or desert season, and you end up there. And I don't know, how many of you guys have been to a desert, like an actual legitimate desert? Have you guys ever been in a desert when it's not windy? Have you, do, do you know what I'm talking about? Like, if you go to a desert and the wind stops blowing, it is ominously quiet. Okay, it's, it's like the, the silence is deafening. It's so quiet, right? But here's the thing. When you're in a place like that, it's the only time that you have where the voices aren't in your head, that you're not being marketed to. There isn't a song, a radio, a person uh, uh, honking their horn. There isn't someone yelling, a baby crying. There isn't bickering. There isn't this. There isn't that. It's all gone. And you have this small, still moment where you could just feel and hear the breath of God. And maybe, maybe the voice that spoke the entire universe into existence Maybe, just maybe, in that moment, if God can just breathe something into you, that he could spark something so much bigger in us, then we never even knew it was possible. It's not the worst thing in the world to be in a desert season, because a desert season is, I believe, the season where the miracles are made. You may not see the miracle in that season, but the miracle starts in that season, and when you come out of it, more often than not, you look back and say, it was in the desert. It was in the desert season that this miracle started. And I honest to God believe that you guys have been roaming the desert for a while, but you guys have made it look like an amazing place to be, and I just know that there's a breakthrough for you guys. Again, I don't know what it is. But don't hate the desert season. It's a beautiful place. It's a place that you get to hear God's voice. And I believe a lot of you are going to hear God's voice in new ways coming into this new season. In Hosea chapter 2, it says, uh, I will call you into the wilderness and I will speak tenderly to you there. And then you will no longer refer to me as my master, but you will refer to me as my husband. And your valley of trouble will become a gateway of hope. That the wilderness, the desert. First of all, it's where you hear the sweetness of your father who calls on you. And, he, and, you, and your, your posture towards him changes from my master to my husband, the one who loves me and protects me and honors me. And then my valley of trouble becomes a gateway of hope, a gateway of hope that people pass through and everything's different once they pass through that gateway. That's the wilderness. That's the beauty of the wilderness. All right. Um, just in terms of, I don't, I don't think anyone really knows your background. So um, what has come out of one of your desert seasons? Like, if you could think, I, I know you've had a lot of, you, you got right. some crazy stories, the murdered uncle, like, you got, you got crazy, crazy stories this church doesn't know. Uh, Armin keeps hearing parts of my stories, like, what? Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but w what, what did you say is something that came out of a desert season in your life that has changed the trajectory of your life in a positive way? Mm -hmm. When I, I touched on this lightly a handful of months ago, when uh, you guys heard this story, for those of you who are here, you heard the story several months ago of my daughter uh, who had died during birth and she she died doctor called time of death and she was gone for a total of 29 minutes and uh and then the uh after the doctor called time of death i began to speak to her and i said in the name of jesus breathe and i watched my daughter come back from the dead and uh yeah all day long praise the lord and i think we always want to be 
the people who receive miracles, but we never want to be the people who are in a situation where we need a miracle. Like, I want to see, God, I want to see you raise the dead. Don't let it be my child. <laughs> right? So, um, so nine, ten months before that happened, I had, I had a conversation with the Lord because I was in a desert. I was without a job. I had no money. Um, I was, you know, those, those times where you're like, okay, like, what is, God, what are you doing? Where are you? What is happening? It was the first time, though, in that desert was the first time that I had the gall to, to speak to God with the, with the honesty that Jesus had in Gethsemane, where he's like, please don't make me do it. <laughs> where it wasn't like, oh, far be it from me to question the Lord's ways, right? <laughs> there was nothing pious or phony about Jesus in Gethsemane. It was like brutal, like, please, you know I'm going to follow you, but come on. And... And so I, I began to just be so honest. And I remember this moment where uh, my wife and I were praying. We had no money. We didn't know how we were going to pay our bills. We found out she was, we, we knew she was pregnant. We didn't know it was twins at the time. And we're like, and so we read through the story of um, when, when Jesus calms the storm, the disciples woke him up and Jesus calms the storm. And they, uh, and when Jesus said, you know, Oh, you have little faith. I always took that as like a condemnation. Whenever we hear that, we always think like Jesus is like, why don't you ever have faith? It's like, he's actually not mad. I don't think he's, he's more, I guess I, it was the first time I ever read that and saw the words more being like, what took you so long? Why did you lack the faith? Just talk to me. And so when, when so then we just said like, God, uh, there's a storm and we're going to drown. So you need to wake up. And that was my prayer. It was a wake up. We, there's a storm at wake up. I didn't pretend that I had the answers. I didn't pretend my theology was intact. I just got really honest. And I was like, you're sleeping and I'm dying. So wake up. And I began to see, and, and God answered prayers, but I also began to see God. was. It, it was almost like I heard God be like, okay, finally. Now we're talking, son. Now we're talking. And it, and it taught me trust with the Father. And it was the beginning of God healing a lot in my heart about trust through that desert, through that season of just, all right, well, you got to wake up. So. I always love that story. Wasn't there, they, was there a slight documentary or something made on that? There was. There was a story um, made on my whole family story. Uh, oh, okay. That was, so it wasn't specific just to the birth? It wasn't just the birth. It was actually, it was the birth, and it was the story of my wife and I in our marriage. My wife and I walked through the doorway of divorce. We actually kind of hung out in the lobby for a while. And, uh, and then God, just like he raised the dead in, in, a, in a baby, he raised the dead in a marriage. And, uh, and we, God healed a lot. And so yeah, there was a story. And in fact, uh, the church that did the story uh, showed that video on an Easter Sunday and 2,200 people came to Jesus that weekend from hearing that story. And in the, in the, in the scriptures, we see that one man's journey is another man's faith. We see that over and over again, right? Where we see like the God of Abraham, you know, we, we reference the God of Abraham as an encouragement to you, right? It's like, I can trust in God because of what God did to, for Abraham. And so the story that he gives you is the story that he wants to use for the faith of someone else. That's why your valley of trouble becomes a gateway of hope, yeah. right? Yeah, it's just... When you see God at work and you begin to see, boy, this is a river, and he gets to use all the water however he wants to. And sometimes it's going to be a lazy river, and sometimes it's going to be white rapids. But I know it's going to spit out in the ocean, and that's the ocean where I want to be, so I'm going to stay in it. And then you just watch him, watch him just, you know, trouble the waters <laughs> and just ride it, ride it. It's so good. That's amazing. I still haven't seen it, so I should probably see it at some point. Um, from from your perspective of all the churches that you've been around, what have what have you seen about this church that's kind of set them aside for you? Yeah. Um, more than once, more than twice, more than five times. The conversations with people who 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 hunger for an encounter with God. A couple different conversations where people have said. I feel God at work here. God is up to something. God is doing something. And God loves to be loved and he wants to be wanted. And he answers us when we ask for him. 
that appetite for the move of God. Not a move of God so that we can be on a stage, but a move of God so that we can meet him where he is and in that have our soul satisfied. A move of God because he's all that matters and all that is and all that ever will be. That appetite, I see that appetite. So my question for you, did I interrupt you? you no, know? keep going. I'm my, just looking for something. My question for you, what do you think is next for Riverwood? Where? Oh, correct. Like where, where do they go? Where, do, where does this body go from here? Where do they focus up their attention? What do they say? What do they do next? Ooh. You're going to have to give me time to think on that one. I mean, I, I would just say, don't settle. Don't, don't settle. You, got, you guys know who you are. You guys know what you do. You guys know your value. You guys know how much you can do for a community. You guys know how you lead. You guys know your generosity. You guys know your commitment level. You guys know your dedication levels. Don't settle. Um, I, I'll tell you, one, one of the things I've learned through um, being surrounded by radical men of God um, and women of God is I, I realize the people who have to pray the most have the most dangerous prayers. And I don't mean dangerous in like they're spewing something bad, but they pray differently. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, it, it, it's your typical prayer is, Lord, bless this food, you know? But then you see someone who's just hungered and thirsted for a move of God for so long and prayed so long that they don't, they don't bless food anymore. They're like, Lord, make me hungry make me thirst you know it's it's a different kind of prayer um you look at it from the perspectives of um and we've even talked about it before where you know every time we get into a season we most people most of us start praying things like lord please send someone but what i see in this church is you guys are the type of church that say god here i am send me and i think these are the types of differences that make you guys set apart by a long shot and that's why I'm just saying like don't settle you guys are some dangerous Christians and I don't mean that in the Kool-Aid drinking way um, I mean that in the sense that you guys have deep deep profound commitment and you guys are willing to show up when it's necessary and make things happen and I hope to God you guys don't settle because you guys deserve what you have worked so tirelessly for don't give up, don't settle, don't surrender, unless it's to God, but I would just just understand your value and wait for something that's right. You guys will get it, I promise. I just, I can't, I can't shake how much I feel the hand of God on this church. You, you guys are not the typical pansy American church. Just, you're yeah. not. Amen to that. Hey, I'm leaving, I can say pansy from stage now, so you guys can't. <laughs> Um, so, AJ, from your perspective, if there was um, anything that you saw in this church that you would like to address, um, whether it's good, bad, controversial, whatever it is, is there anything that you've seen that you would say, hey, it's worth addressing this as a church body? The, I mean, as, as soon as I figured out where your question was going, after the fear left, <laughs> um, I was <laughs> you gave me a hard question. Yeah, yeah, I guess I deserve that. Um, no, my, my, my mind immediately went um, to, to the issue or the topic of authenticity. Hmm. Authenticity not as, um, not as, you know, I've said a million times, if I've said it once, don't let words lose their meaning. A cliche is just a cliche if we stop believing the words that it's made of. You know, oh, we got to be authentic. It's like, well, may, may, yeah, that's true. Um, I've heard people say that it's wrong to say, how are you, if you don't really care about the answer or whatever. But really, it's like, if we're being honest, how are you is often just a greeting. You know, so we don't have to necessarily be like, I'm doing terrible, and, and it's just a terrible day, and everything is sad. It's like, okay, well, cool. Uh, I, I just meant to say hello. I didn't mean to say, how are you? So I'm not talking about like some phony authenticity where you just have to tell everybody everything all the time. I have, a, I have a good friend of mine, his name is Marius, who uses the word invisible narratives. 
Mm. to talk about the things that we don't see that are steering and changing and shaping and guiding the culture that we're in. They exist in businesses, they exist in marriages, they exist in individuals, and they exist in churches. Invisible narratives. And those invisible narratives could be power structures, they could be conflict, they could be disagreements. Uh, there's a lot of different things they could be and can be. What I do know is that the, the authentic life is one that is willing to be called out on something, mm. is willing to be humble and say, yeah, I could be wrong on this one, and uh, that's okay. God is under no assumption that I'm perfect, and if I'm under that assumption, it's a place where me and God differ, so I should probably align with God on this one. And, and that willingness to be called out, that willingness to rethink structures, to, to be more committed to a move of God than to maintaining and sustaining what you've always had, to be more committed to the pathways that lead through the ocean, the roads that lead through the sea, pathways that no one know are, are there, than to be committed to the roads that everyone's always gone down. I'm more committed to the road that I don't see because God hasn't yet parted the waters. But to be willing to go there. And I don't know that I observe that on this like toxic level at this church so much as I know humanity enough to know that we are born with a desire and a tendency to protect our own little empire and that we're all desperately afraid of not doing it right and so we we protect our hearts and we, we do our best to look a certain way. But to be willing to go there and to say, I'm willing to do whatever it is God tells me to do to, so, that when, so that when he makes a move, I say I'm with him. And that, that's that faith that is so much more than a hoop you jump through. It's the river you get into. And that's to me is it. And if I had to preach one sermon... It would be letting God have all of you and not protecting any of it out of the fear or the wounds or the, any of that stuff. That God, I'm all in on God and letting him steer every conversation, every relationship, all of it. You got one more message, so. <laughs> hey, there, you there go. it is, there it is. You're yeah. welcome, thanks I, for teeing that up. That's right, no, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I had to answer that same question, I. I would say one of the things I've seen in this church that is um, just a opportunity, not just for growth, but impact and excitement and deeper intimacy is um, there's a part of this church that feels very conflict avoidant. I could be wrong. It could just be a perception that I have just because of my background or whatever, but there, there's a perception of conflict avoidance, and I think there's scenarios I work, walk into where um, it, it's perceived as harmonious, but I, I, I kind of like take a couple of steps back and look at the situation. And I'm like, ah, this is fake harmony. As in, there is no harmony here. We're just pretending. And, um, and passive aggressive cultures have a tendency to create that. And I'm not saying you guys are all passive aggressive or anything like that. But I do, I do, I do see a lot of conflicts being avoided. And I'm, I'm not saying that to trash talk, backhand, condescend, or anything like that. I just, the only reason I say that is I think we avoid conflicts because we think people are much more evil than they really are. Like, where we make the, and here, here's why we do it. We think about how we would judge ourselves if we, they, if we did what they did, and we know how critical we are of ourselves, so we just assume that if I go fess up to something, or if I go have a debate with someone, or if I tell someone, hey, when you did this, this isn't right, that it's just going to explode, the relationship is going to end, and it's going to be super awkward walking into church, I'm going to have to sit on that side, they're going to have to sit on this side, we're going to have to split up our friends groups, uh, it's not that serious, it really isn't. A lot of times, and if you guys need prime example, talk to Miss New Yorker over here. She's very direct. She knows how to show the way. But um, it, it, you, you'd be shocked how much people um, actually end up thriving with you in relationship when they know that if something is off, that one, if you're called out on it, that you're quick to apologize, 
uh, or two, come and ask about it yourselves. Or even if, like, I have a problem with you, I come and tell you. Like, my assumption isn't going, hey, when you said X, Y, Z, it really hurt my feelings, and because of that, I'm just angry at you, and I just want you to know I hate you, and then I walk away. Like, that, 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 that's bad conflict. But if you guys can have a healthy conflict, you can say, hey, this happened, someone said this, this is how I felt, what were you trying to get to, help me understand, just get through the conflict. I promise you guys, you guys will come out of this with every single one of your conflicts. You're gonna have deeper friendships, more intimate friendships. Coming to church is going to mean a lot more to you guys. And here's what, when it really matters, is when the proverbial crap hits the fan in your life, you're not going to want to reach out to the people that you have no relationship with and no conflict with. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you haven't gone through the struggle with them enough yet to want to invite them into your own struggle. It's okay. Struggle with people so that the day comes that you have a struggle. You, it, it's a lot easier to call someone and say, come help me with this. Don't avoid the conflict. I promise outside on the other side of conflict, there is reconciliation, there is peace, there is hope, there is love, there is grace, there is God, there is miracles. Don't run away from it, run to it, and give people a chance to suck at being human. It's okay, some will fail you, but most won't. Most people want reconciliation. Most people want to forgive. Most people want forgiveness. And, the, and those of us who are very unforgiving, just remember, unforgiveness is like drinking poison hoping that it kills the other person. It does nothing for you to live in a constant state of unforgiveness, and you will stay in a constant state of unforgiveness if your conflicts are not addressed. Go toe to toe, go head to head, give humanity a chance to fail you. Don't just assume their failure. Conflict is not that scary. It is a bonding experience. It is an influence building experience. It's an influence garnering experience. And if you're leaders in this church, for the love of God and for the love of church, you better be having conflict. You have to have conflict. If you're leading, you have to have conflict. If not, you're, you're creating fake harmony thinking you're doing something healthy when it's completely unhealthy. Own it. And just trust that you'll come out fine and the other person will come out fine too, especially when God's in the middle of it. God's not in the game of tearing humanity and relationships apart. Do you know what I'm saying by that? Was that harsh? You guys can throw something if you want, if that'll make you feel better. Okay. All right. All right. Any last notes before we wrap up? It's 11 a.m. No, I, you know, I think I'll be up one more time. Um, the, it's kind of fun. We didn't, we didn't intentionally sync our answers on that question. But the idea of the way that authenticity and just being willing to let God like, I'm not going to, like, I like this idea of, like, letting human, humans suck at being human. It's like, a lot of times my wife will say, like, one of my favorite verses in Scripture is when Jesus says, no one takes from me my life, I willingly give it. Because you see in that, Jesus was no patsy. He was not, he was not bullied. He was not a martyr. He was not, and he, he willingly gave his life. In that is for us to go into relationship realizing people are broken they're going to handle things poorly. They're going to whatever. But to let God steer you in that and to say, like, look, no one can take anything from me because it all belongs to him. That would mean they could take from him. <laughs> they can't. So if we really are, if it all belongs to him, it's a lot easier to do what you're saying. Because now my reputation belongs to him, so they can't take that because it doesn't belong to me. They couldn't take it from me because they'd have to go through him. Hmm. And they would lose that fight every time. Amen. So it really, it's amazing to see how those two are connected. I love that. Well, um, we don't want to spend too much time or take up too much more of your time. So I'll just wrap on this note and uh, we'll go into worship. If you guys want to come up here and get set, feel free. Um, I'll say this in in a world um, where I, I think our culture is starting to get um, slightly dangerous in the sense that no one is allowed to say anything unless it's going to make everyone feel good and feel whatever. Um, and I would just say, if, if you have that mentality, just understand that is a very, very limited, under, a limited mindset. The greatest improvements 
I have ever made or any of my friends have ever made or those people that I see as the most successful people, a lot of times that, that jump to evolution or the evolved version of themselves more often than not came from extremely uncomfortable conversations with people they trust. My mentors are not nice people to me, but they love me into success. They're not, they're not the friendliest to me when they're having conflict with me, but I have always come out better. And I have come out a better husband, I've come out a better friend, I've come out a better leader, a better pastor, a better whatever. So if, you're, if you have a mindset that you think that the only time you should speak is to make everyone feel good and safe and happy and da da da, and, or if you think that the only time someone should talk to you is based on that, I promise you that is a mentality that will do nothing but limit you and what you have capable and the calling that God has on your life. Don't be scared, have hard conversations, and just know you're by far stronger than you think you are. The world wants you to think you're weak, but the most dangerous thing that you can ever believe as a Christian is realizing how dangerous you are based on how much power you have, how much authority you have, how much influence you have, what you can do to shake and move mountains. As long as you believe you are weak, you will do weak things. But the instant you break off that weakness mindset, God help this community in every way, shape, and form because you're about to go crazy doing ministry. That's what will set you guys apart. You are not weak, you are strong. And you don't need to be qualified. You guys have heard this. God calls the quali or God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Let him call you, answer it, let him do the rest. You guys are strong, strong people. I love and I envy your strength. Let nothing take it away from you guys. You guys are a church of miracles waiting to happen. It's been a friggin' honor and a privilege and a pleasure being here with you guys. One more message from me, one more message from AJ, and then it's see you later, but not goodbye. We'll probably come back and visit, especially because Tim is here and someone has to harass him and keep him humble. So God bless you guys. Thanks again.